welcome to Vita. And it's a, a great day to come. It's a special day to come um, as we celebrate the resurrection uh, of Jesus Christ. And so I promised the children I'm not going to talk for too long because they're ready for their Easter eggs. But uh, I'll, say, I'll say something um, about this. Just before I do, a couple of things, just sort of brief notices. But to connect with us, we're sort of electronic, really. So you go to the website, complete uh, something on the website, and we'll be able to send you emails and let you know what's going on and different groups starting and that sort of thing. So just go to the website and um, complete. That's how you'll be able to connect. So three things to say. The, the first thing I, I love about Christianity more than anything, two things I suppose you might say. One is everything comes back to Jesus. Everything comes back to him. The history of the church, I don't have to tell you, is fraught with many things that uh, contemporary Christians or contemporary Christian leaders are having to apologize for or repent of. But there's nothing in Jesus Christ that you can go back to and say, I don't like this or I don't like that. The founder of our faith, the founder of Christianity, the, the God who became man, who humbled himself and came to join us. What a wonderful saviour we worship. That will never change. Your life can have ups, it can have downs, it could have sickness, it can have all kinds of things, but the resurrection of Jesus will never change. He is the same yesterday, today and forever. He is fixed. His love, his, his gloriousness is fixed. It's unchanging. He's done it. He's risen from the dead. And the second thing in coming back to Jesus is that it's fact. This really happened 2,000 years ago. It's not, a, uh, it's not a contemporary myth. It's not a made-up story. It's not created imaginatively by some clever authors. Remember, at the time of Jesus, there were many hostile witnesses to him. The hostile witnesses were the Jews, the Pharisees, the Sadducees, many people, the Romans. These were hostile witnesses to Christianity. And yet these disciples and others were saying, we've seen him alive. Witnesses now, when we read the Gospels, witnesses to his resurrection. People who'd seen him alive, like John. This, in 1 John, John says, this is the, the man that we've touched and eaten. And he's saying, this is, this is the God we know. This is Jesus that we know. Fact. Many have tried to disprove the resurrection and failed. In fact, many, many erudite, you know, lawyer-type people, people of academic minds have investigated and, and come to the conclusion that it's true. It's true. Twelve, these 12 disciples who suffered so much in their lives because they believed it, because they'd seen him and they know that Jesus is alive and that it's true. So these disciples were surprised, I think, as much as, as anyone. Jesus understood the call. He understood why he came. I think, I, I wonder if eons before, Jesus sometimes, I imagine, talking to the Father, saying, I'll get them, I'll rescue them, Dad, I'll, I'll go and rescue them. And the Father, yes, son, but it's going to be very, very difficult. It's not an afterthought of God in rescuing you and me. This is the epicenter of life itself. But sometimes get lost in the maelstrom of news or family or whatever's going on in the world. And you think, this is, this is what's going on in the world. And, you know, I, I, I look at the BBC and it's all about one thing. And, you know, it's, it's like, are we the centre of the universe in England? What about the rest of the world? Well, even if you look at the rest of the world, Jesus is at the epicentre of everything. And he wants to be at the epicenter of our life. He wants to be at the center of our lives. That's what the resurrection really teaches us. He is risen from the dead. If we can grasp that, if we can think about that, if we can revolve our lives around that. Remember, before Jesus, Jesus said all sorts of things. In John 14, 27, he says, I'm leaving you with a gift, peace. 
My peace I give you, my peace I live with you. Jesus promised the disciples peace. But he said to them, I'm leaving you. In John 14, um, another 27, that can't be right. But he says, you heard me say I'm going away and I'm, I will be coming back. It's, uh, Jesus told the disciples again, I'm leaving you, but I'm coming back. In John 14, 16, he says, I'll not leave you all alone like orphans. I will come back to you in a very short time. Um, the people in the world will not see me anymore. He kept saying these things to the disciples. In other words, Jesus knew his mission, his call. He knew why he was coming. It wasn't a, an accident. It wasn't an aforethought. This was, this was God himself deciding. I can't tell you, I, I can't put it into words, the gravitas of it, or the seriousness with which we have to take the words and message of Jesus Christ. It's so easy, it's so easy in the West to lose the gravitas of his words and, and to get on with life. And we'll be very disappointed at the end of our life if we don't take his words seriously. So, the disciples, after all this, understood nothing. Because when Jesus died on the cross, they were pretty done in. I think my favorite recording of post -res you know, the resurrection, the first person, to, you know, when Jesus is alive, and Mary, I want to say a typical woman, but she's so bereft, and she, she runs to the tomb. And of course, as far as she's concerned, Jesus is dead. But sometimes you see that in people who are utterly bereft, they've lost someone. I remember my grandma saying to me when her husband died, my grandfather, she said, she said to me, she said, I want to go to his grave and I want to rip the soil away. I I'm, I'm so want to get back to him. Well, that was Mary. She didn't know why, but she ran to the tomb. And, and of course, the tombs rolled away. He's no longer there. Then she turns around and there's a gardener and she says, well, my, my Lord, where, where have you taken him? And she looks at him again and he says, Mary. And she screams at the top of her voice, doesn't she, Rabboni, and holds him. I mean, physically, I think Mary ran over and held Jesus around the way. She, she wasn't about to let go of him again. He's risen. He's risen from the dead. Then Jesus says, go back and tell the disciples and Peter. That's the second thing I love about Jesus. He cares about each of us. Jesus suddenly loves us beyond oceans of love. He loves us. Or with all our messy sinfulness, he loves us. Go back to the disciples, tell them I'm arisen. And Peter, specifically Peter. Because of course Peter had betrayed him. Peter was very, feeling pretty broken at this point. But Jesus takes notice. Mary, tell Peter, I'm back. I'm risen. And what God's doing in the, in the resurrection are, are several things. The theology really comes from Jesus himself. For the Son of Man came not to, to, um, to be served, but to serve and give his life as a ransom for many. Jesus came to die as a sacrifice in our place. And that's added to in Titus and the epistles and so on, why Jesus had to die. But now it's done. Now it's finished. Now we have it made. Peace is given to us in this life. Yes, wars, yes, rumors of wars, things that the world are going to be very afraid of, but not for us. Not for, not for Christians. He's overcome the world. That's the glorious truth of the resurrection that we celebrate um, today. The second thing about the resurrection that, that it, it, it says is that there's no sitting on the fence. It's very confrontational, the resurrection of Jesus, because it tells human beings you're accountable. You are accountable to a God that you can believe in or not believe in, but you are accountable. One day you will be held to account for your life before the Son of God. And there will be no gainsaying Jesus. There'll be no looking at Jesus and being able to parley with him or, or talk to him. He's done it. It's finished. For us, when we come to him, our sins are forgiven. 
but it is confrontational to the world. In uh, 1 Corinthians 1.8, it says, For the message of the cross is foolishness to those who are perishing, but to those who are being saved, it is the power of God. In other words, his resurrection, there's no sitting on the fence with Jesus. I've never understood liberal Christianity, and I mean that nicely. I've never understood it. I don't understand how you can take the words and message of Jesus and somehow eradicate some and believe others. It's like it's all or nothing. He's a wonderful saviour with a wonderful message, but there's no sitting on the fence with Jesus. You're either for him or you're against him. You're on the right side of history or you're on the wrong side of history. You're either being saved or you're perishing. You are either in light or in darkness, but you cannot be halfway. That's the message of the cross and the resurrection message of Jesus Christ that is so glorious. And at the end of the age, I want to be on the right side of history. And I haven't attained it yet. So I press on to take hold of that which Christ Jesus has taken hold of me. We press on and keep moving, keep going forward. So the message is confrontational. Because English people, and there's some people here we've got from the US and Martinique and the Caribbean and all over the place, you know. Um, but this is about English people. We basically think we're pretty good. Australian. We think we're pretty good in England, you know. Well, we, we you know, we help other countries and we, you know, when there's a, a you know, we, we give money to whatever it might be, whatever the thing is that's, that's coming up. We think we're pretty good. But you see, it's confrontational because, because God says, no, you're not. That's why I came. That's why I came to the cross and I'm risen. Because you're not any good. If you were good, he wouldn't have needed to come. Now that makes me feel pretty good about my sin. I listened to someone the other day who was recounting something that uh, someone we, we know who's dead now, John Wimber. And he, he would have been in his 60s. And John Wimber said, you know, I thought that I'd be getting holier by now. But I'm still a sinner. When the Pope was asked, the very first time when the Pope was, you know, made Pope, and I have to say, when the red, the red curtain was moved away, I was a bit disappointed because he was so old. <laughs> I thought, he is so old. But then as I began to listen to him, I thought, man, this guy knows Jesus. He's an elder. He's an elder in the church. And when he was asked, who, we are, who are you, Pope, whatever his name, I can't pronounce his in Italian, and he said, I am so-and-so, I am a sinner. I am a sinner. You see, it confronts the world, because if you, if you want to not be a sinner, if you want to pretend you're not a sinner, Christianity isn't for you. Find another philosophy to live by. If you want to live by a religion that says, oh, you can become a better person, you can become fitter and better and nicer and everything, you're in the wrong religion. Because as, Christ, as Christians, it confronts, it confronts everyone. Jesus had to die for your sin. Therefore, it, acknowledging that you're a sinner is, is nice and easy for me. Lord, I'm a sinner, have mercy on me. 1 Corinthians chapter 15 says this, um, where Paul really is speaking to the Corinthians who are completely lost, really. They remind me, actually, speaking to some of our friends today, they remind me of a charismatic Christianity that has forgotten the man on the cross. It loves the joy. It loves the jumping up and down. It loves the worship. It loves the healing and the miracles. It loves the words of knowledge and the spiritual for gifts. But it doesn't understand the man of suffering on the cross and where it comes from. And if you forget him, you don't have Christianity anymore. And so you, you have a religion that's filled with greed and selfishness and, and my wants. Instead of understanding that when he rose from the dead, when he paid everything for us, the joyous news, we can give it all to him and then just live for him. Now, brothers and sisters, I want to remind you of the gospel I preached on which you've received and taken your stand. The gospel, you are saved if you hold firmly to the word I preached to you. Otherwise, you've believed in vain. That's the part of Christianity where you don't just sit back. You have to keep moving forward. 
And he says, what I received, I passed on to you of first importance. I wish that was highlighted. Of first importance to Christianity, that Christ died for our sins according to the scriptures. It's Isaiah 53. He was buried. He was raised on the third day according to the scriptures. He appeared to Peter, Cephas, then to the twelve. <clears throat> and after that, he appeared to more than 500 of the brothers and sisters. Now, I remember when Paul wrote that, there are hostile witnesses. They would come forward. They'd say, that's not true. But they couldn't say that. They couldn't come forward. The people who've seen the resurrected Christ are alive at the time that Paul is writing this letter. They've seen him. They're going around. They're telling people. What glorious news. That's what we remember today, as if it was yesterday. As if it, we're just hearing this great news. Jesus Christ is alive. It changes everything. It changes the course of our life, the purpose of our life, how we're meant to live. The hardest thing in the West is to live for Christ. We just get caught up in other things. Caught up in our careers, caught up in our jobs, caught up, but we're to live for him. First, he's first, everything else is second. And I love that then that Paul says, he says, but if it is preached that Christ has been raised, that if, if it is preached that Christ has been raised from the dead, how can some of you say there's no resurrection? If Christ has not been raised, our preaching is useless. See, everything falls on this one thing. Basically, um, if he hasn't risen from the dead, Christianity is useless. I mean, everything falls on that. But Christ is risen from the dead. He is coming back, just as he said. He is preparing a home for us in heaven, as he said, because we can trust his words. We can trust his words, that he is God. We did a little service for Good Friday, and Esther, one of them, and he, children, I'm going to finish soon. <laughs> Look at my daughter's face. And um, but she asked me, it, it was a great question, what about all the other religions? What do you say about those other religions? You see, Jesus confronts all the other religions. Because he's God. This is God. This is the only God. This is the creator God who made us all. There are no other ways to him or through him or in him. Only Christianity, only Jesus Christ. There, are no, there is no other philosophy or way. Everything else. And when people come saying this is the way, they are false. Because they directly contradict the Son of God. Now are people created in the image of God? Absolutely. Are we to respect everyone regardless of what religion they believe? Absolutely. But we cannot take Jesus away from the center of everything the creator of all things. And that's whom we worship today and thank God. In Galatians 3 verse 1, Paul says, you foolish Galatians, who's bewitched you? Before your very eyes, Jesus Christ was clearly portrayed as crucified. And I'd like to learn just one thing from you. Did you receive the spirit by the works of the law or by believing what you heard? Are you so foolish after beginning with the spirit? Are you trying to finish by means of the flesh? Very simply, people hear the gospel and get saved. You know, it was lovely with Dan last week. You hear the gospel, you, you're saved. You say, well, what do you have to do? Nothing. Believe, that's what you have to do. Repent, turn from the life you're living, that's it. He's done it. That's why Christianity is wonderful news. That's what we celebrate today as we leave, as we walk away. He's done it. I don't have to. So having believed, having received the Holy Spirit, walk in it. Don't go back to works. Don't go back to thinking I'm a good person and I can earn my favor with God in that way. You can't. It's done. He's done it. We can just accept it. Surrender to him. And I love it because whatever happened to the Galatians in terms of receiving the Spirit, it was pretty obvious that they recognized it as an event. They became a Christian and it was a recognizable event in their life. They received the Spirit. Many of you will recognize that same thing. 
And so I've got to, as a preacher, you know, there's only two sides to this. You're in light or you're in darkness. You're perishing or you're being saved. That's it. And then lastly, 1 Corinthians 15, you know, where, O oh death, is your victory? Where, O oh death, is your sting? Listen, Christianity is like having it made. I mean, not always in this life. I don't know what the promises are in this life, but to the poorest, remember the story of the rich man and Lazarus. Lazarus, when the, the dogs used to lick his sores, when he used to eat the crumbs from the table of the rich man, but there he is in the kingdom of God with Abraham. The resurrection of Jesus changes everything. It confronts everyone. It confronts the world we live in and it confronts us. It's a glorious, glorious truth to the way in which we live. It makes sense of life and the life that we're now living. And he has destroyed death. I'm not saying it's not sad when people die and sometimes unexpectedly that we know that we belong to Jesus but they're, they're still alive. They're still alive. They're just in a different place now. I came to Jesus once asking him, trying to catch him out, and he said, you're badly mistaken. And he quoted them, I'm the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. In other words, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob are still alive. They're still alive. Death is done. Death is over. It's just a transference from from this kind of sphere of life to another. That's what the resurrection means. It means we have hope beyond this life. It means we have a tremendous hope in this life. It means we can personally know God and trust the words of Jesus. We can trust him. We can trust what he said. We can believe him. And we can walk away this morning with a, with a kind of a sense of joyousness that I belong, if indeed you do belong. But I am one of those preachers that always warns people because you can't have it both ways. If you're not sure you belong, think about that. Because you think, Chris, I don't like what you said. It will be much worse to hear it from Jesus. I never knew you. I never knew you. What frightening words from the Son of God. In this life, make the choice for Jesus Christ. And then let's keep making it. And as churches, we encourage one another to keep making that choice. Amen? Amen. Let's stand then. Let's pray. Let's get our worship people. Hey, Dan. How's your first week as a Christian? It's um, been quite amazing. It's been emotional. Um, <laughs> what can I say? How was Vita today? Very good. Very emotional. Everything that was, was um, talked about was completely relevant to the way I've been feeling over the last week. Say hello so. to our online church. Give hello, away. online church. How was Vita today? Amazing. So, so, I mean, it's brought everyone out in tears. The Holy Spirit is here. I'm feeling it. I'm feeling the love. Yeah. I feel great. <laughs> That's what a pastor wants to hear. Yes. How about Mo? You've off. gone a far away. Come on. Um, yeah, beautiful. As Easter usual. Sunday. Yeah, lovely. Bless you. Don't like Bless. me. <laughs> you can so tell me. Bless so you. uncomfortable. Sorry. So how was Vita today? <laughs> Sorry, Emma, I'm putting you on the spot. Oh, wow. No, no, it's, it's okay. It's okay. <laughs> so, hi, everyone. Uh, today, Vita was quite good. I mean, trying to reconnect the resurrection of Christ and what we have to do uh, for our lives that He died for us, for our sins. And because of that, we are saved. Because He lives, we are saved. Yeah. How was Vita for you today? <laughs> Sorry? How was Vita for you today? Um, it was very great. I, I, want, I would like to thank Emma for bringing me into the church uh, for the first time. And uh, I feel really in peace, I would say. And uh, yeah, thank great. you for having me. Nice to have you with us. <laughs> thank you. <laughs> How was Vita today? Oh, very good, Chris. Yeah, <laughs> excellent. The worship was fantastic. Your 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 word was fantastic. Um, it's Easter Easter Sunday. Um, and our friend from Madeira, how was it? First very time. welcoming. Thank you. Yes, it was enjoyable. I'm glad you liked it. Yes. Yeah. And Mike, inspiring, Chris, as always. No, very thought-provoking today. It was really yeah. It went deep to 
you know, deep in. So yeah, it was good. Really enjoyed it. Good Sunday at Vita. How was Vita today? Yes, I've been making, no I didn't make the coffee, Charlotte made the coffee, I did the hot cross buns and all the food bits and I've packed you a nice picnic lunch to take in the car. Oh, Helen, thank you very much. <laughs> Marvellous. How was Vita today? It was amazing. It was amazing. Not fantastic. Yeah. Two sisters. Yeah. So, you had a good time? Yeah, it was great. Well, you're, you're in it too, yeah. Helen. Yeah. I love Helen. <laughs> All right, give a wave to our online church. Happy Easter! Happy, Happy Easter. Easter! How was Vita today? Very the hard working good. refreshments team? <laughs> yeah, it was all good. We had lots of hot cross buns. <laughs> yeah. Happy Easter! How was Vita today? It was great. Wonderful. That's what a pastor wants to hear, isn't it? <laughs> you might say they're telling the pastor what he wants to hear, but it really was an amazing day. So. Give a wave to our online church. Happy. Yeah. How was Vita today for you, our American friends? <laughs> it was good. I enjoyed the service. I enjoyed the service very much. Yeah. I, I think part of it you're going to say to the pastor, rubbish, you know. <laughs> anyway, give a, I'm glad. It's great to have you around today. Just give a wave to our online church and uh, I'll post it for next week. Great, Matt. Nice to have you at church today. How was Vita? Thank you. It was excellent. Thank you. It's lovely to come back here and um, enjoying the weather and uh, had a wonderful service. Lovely to see my brothers and sisters in Christ and happy Easter. Give a wave to our online and happy Easter. Yes, great. How was Vita today? Good. What was good about it? I don't know. Why do you get Easter eggs? Easter eggs? How many Easter eggs have you got? Um, 60, I think. How many? 60. 60?